the main method of my dissertation is to try to get at this question, which is, where's the water going to go in the mountains with climate change? Where's the water going to go without the snow? Whether in Chile or in California, hydrologist Katie Markovich is looking for ways to understand water resources and climate change. The thing that is tricky for California is that we have that Mediterranean climate, so all of the water is falling in the course of a couple months in the winter season. So what we used to have was the snowpack, which was basically an intermediate reservoir which holds that water until late spring, early summer, when it starts to melt out which is very convenient for us because we're able to store enough water in the reservoirs for the winter, which serve for water supply, flood control, and hydropower. So for climate change, what that means is that we essentially just have a longer drought because that rain is gonna fall at the same time and it's gonna fall as rain and not snow. It is a challenge for California because right now we're not set up for that type of a climate system. Less snow and more rain, as most climate projections predict, is a challenge for our California infrastructure. Chile, like California, faces climate-driven shifts in the proportions of snow, rain, and groundwater availability. Dr. Markovich's team went in search of water sources in the Digalin River east of Concepcion, Chile. So the team snow survey was Lauren Foster, who is a PhD candidate at Colorado School of Mines working with Reed Maxwell, Stephen Maples, who works here at UC Davis with Graham Fogg, and then myself. So Steve came to help me out when I had to go and sample this sort of really, really far and potentially dangerous site. I was the resident avalanche safety sort of point person going down there. so. That was my role, was to kind of keep an eye out on the avalanche conditions and backcountry travel and things like that. The end goal is to build a model to be able to project what's going to happen when the snow melts too soon or the precipitation falls as rain. In order to do that, you need to use these big, you know, integrated hydrologic models. So it's not just groundwater that I'm, I'm simulating. I'm simulating surface water and I'm simulating vegetation and then, you know, climate that's acting as basically like the the driving forces of the model. The really challenging scientific questions are happening at the interfaces between disciplines. So there's a lot of interaction between the hydrologic science community and the climate science community. So that's what I'm doing in Chile actually is to try to get at these signatures of water. So the snow signature and then the spring snow melt signature because that's going to be slightly different from the snow. In the summertime, because they also have a Mediterranean climate, we can assume that pretty much any of the water that's in the rivers is coming from groundwater, and so that's gonna help me get at that groundwater signature. So once I have those, I'll be able to do that sort of inverse calculation of stream flow in the river in my system to show how, you know, the proportions of water coming from snow versus groundwater shift over time, and then compare that to a model. This will help water managers and land use planners in Chile consider their water portfolio as they invest in infrastructure. For California, much of the large infrastructure projects have already been built, but Chile has a chance to plan with climate change in mind. And especially in the mountains, there's just not a lot of data. It's just really hard to access a lot of these regions. So that was what we were doing this past summer, which was winter down there was digging snow pits and taking snow cores. So snow pits are really fun, as it turns out. And you basically just dig a pit and you make a wall and you just sample with depth, you know, 10 centimeters at a time. And with that, you're able to get the changes in density of the snowpack with depth, which is important for determining the actual water content of the snow. And you're also taking samples of each of those to get at the isotopic signature with depth. And so that, ultimately is kind of like a, a depth for time because we know that these events are deposited sequentially. And because I can't collect every single snow event while I'm down there, you can sample that and sort of infer how that signature might change as the season progresses. Though the chemical properties of an atom are determined by the number of protons, each element is also subclassed into isotopes by variations in the number of neutrons. All oxygen has eight protons, and usually eight neutrons. 
detectable by specialized lab equipment, oxygen-18 has 10 neutrons, making it heavier. A signature is basically, I'm referring to the stable isotopic signature. So water is made of hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And so when I say a signature, I mean that unique combination of light isotope to heavy isotope of oxygen or of hydrogen. A signature will be different in space and in time, always. Even in the same stream, you can go upstream and downstream, and that signature is going to vary. I and mean, you can take the ratio of that slightly heavier oxygen to the lighter one. And with that, be able to track signatures of water. So we know that rain is going to be a little bit lighter because it's the stuff that evaporates off and the lighter one's going to evaporate off sooner. And then we know as that rain travels across the land surface, it's also going to get increasingly lighter because the heavier stuff is going to rain out first. And then when you get up to the snow, that signature is super depleted, as we call it. It's basically going to be the, a really, really light signature. So with these techniques, we're able to then take a sample of river water and back calculate what proportion of that came from snow and what proportion of that came from groundwater. I think California can provide a lot of guidance for what to do and especially what not to do for other places that are starting to experience some issues in terms of water supply, water reliability, and things like that. As the human footprint on water grows worldwide, I think a lot of places can look to California for the sorts of do's and don'ts. My work is going to inform UC Water's goals of connecting all of these stores of water, you know, the snowpack and mountain groundwater and the Front Range, all the way to the Central Valley aquifers and irrigated agriculture. I just really love that I can contribute in that small way to the, the growing awareness of climate change. <laughs>